So let me do a, a quick introduction. You can tell by my accent, I'm from Cork. Uh, um, this is actually a talk that, uh, that uh, Mark Littlefield actually convinced me to do last September, so thanks. Um, and to sort of frame this up, I've been doing product management in Silicon Valley since, since electricity, if anybody's old enough to remember that. Uh, uh, the late 80s, I did my first product management job. And what I do mostly these days is I parachute into companies as the interim or temporary VP of product to help get things running again when it's not working less at an individual product level, but really at the company level. So how do we product manage the company? How do we come in and get things working uh, between sales and marketing on one side, generally, and engineering and product management on the other side? And so, so the, the theory here, which we'll see in a second, is really about the conversation that we have between the sales and marketing side of the house about things we need and how urgent they are and how soon we're going to get them, and things on the engineering and product management side of the house where we're asked to do some things that are actually not possible in the physical world. So uh, I reach for Isaac Newton, in, in case you don't recognize him. Um, uh, in fact, there's a picture here. So, Famous, famous piece of fruit, right? And, and the, the tagline here that's really important is, gravity's not just a good idea, it's the law, right? Um, so when we think about the, the folks on the sales and marketing side, and particularly CEOs who may have come up on the sales and marketing side of the house, do they believe in the same laws of gravity that those of us on the engineering and product side believe in? So I should ask first, anybody here who's a CEO? Anybody who's worked in sales? OK, good. So you guys will keep me honest, right? And actually, there's one other thing I have to do here, which is this is supposed to be a very interactive session. So we're going to give books away to folks who give me the right answers to the questions, OK? Um, if you're in the back, I'll just pass it back, because no one wants to hear me talk for 40 minutes. OK, good. So uh, the way we're going to set this up is I'm going to suggest that there are really four laws of software economics. <laughs> And we're going to ask for each of those the question of, do the folks on the sales and marketing side of the house believe the same laws of physics or software economics that the folks on the engineering side believe? And as product managers, we're always the people in the middle trying to do this translation between what's wanted and what's possible. So um, if this looks familiar, then, then we're doing the right thing. OK, so here's our first fact. Do we know this fact? Okay. Right. Uh, it turns out to be true that no matter how big your engineering team is, it will never be big enough to build all the things you've been asked to build. Okay? Now, that'll seem really obvious to some of you, but let's come back to anybody who's been on the sales side of the house and ask if you believe it. Right? And if you go to a CEO who's come up from the sales and marketing side of the house, generally this is a fact that's disputed. Okay? No, that can't be. Right? Because the thing I want is actually really important. Right? Um, so, but there's proof. There's actual proof that the development team isn't big enough. OK, anybody tell me what the proof is? OK, we'll have to show it. And this is a picture actually from Boston from last September. But essentially, uh, this is the problem we're in. If you go to the sales and marketing side of the house and say these magic words, we think there's a little space in next week's sprint if you've got something you need, right? Anybody ever use those words? I've actually never used those words, okay? But the next, what's the next thing that happens after you say those words? Right? About four and a half years worth of engineering things are going to arrive to fit into next week's space, right? Um, it, it's not possible, uh, even though we all believe it, that we're just one engineering hire away from meeting our goals, right? That we're one QA test cycle away from catching up from everything in the backlog. Because the minute we see the bottom of the backlog, thousands of people out there raise their hands with really, really good ideas for what's missing, right? So, so this is a story, actually, that we don't always get general belief in. But that's OK. Here's see if we recognize any of these quotes. This is this going to work? There we go. So things that I've heard that are true, right? <laughs> We, there must be room in the development stack, right? Why must there be room? Because the CEO said it was important, right? There must be room because, well, actually, yes, we did promise it to a prospect, so therefore we have to do it, right? Um, how hard could it be, right? Actually, um, that's my favorite one. Anybody use these words? 
if you say these words to a developer and you don't have a smile on your face, you're going to get punched, okay? Um, this, this must be said in jest and only when the, the, the sarcasm light is turned on or the little happy face, right? How hard could it be? It's probably only 10 lines of code, right? Uh, we've been talking about it for months. So therefore, we must be mostly done, right? Um, the, the, right? We've gone agile. And of course, agile gives us infinite capacity and the ability to change our minds at least once a sprint, maybe once a day if necessary, right? And then the last one, um, I'm not sure what, what the local um, equivalent is, but uh, sometimes in the US, we talk about the, the Home Depot version of developer staffing, which means I'm just going to take my pickup truck drive it to the place where all the folks at the DIY store are and are willing to work for 10 euro an hour. And I'm going to bring them back to the office and sit them in front of computers, right? Because obviously we don't have enough people working in development. And the solution is to have more people working in development, right? So because if my neighbor's kid could do it, how hard could it be, right? Uh, there's an infinite list of these. And these are all about the problem of the person asking for this thing knows it's really important, right? Now, back to previous discussion, that doesn't actually create anything new in terms of capacity, but it's important, right? So here's our first law, because we need four, right? Anybody who can't count up, up to four, this is going to be a problem, right? Sales, Sales right? Um, you can count up to four. You can count up to four if that's your quota, by the way. Indeed. And because and if you get to five, you get to club and you get to go to Hawaii, right? <laughs> really important. But, but the, the takeaway here is that the folks on the sales and marketing side actually believe in a world that's defined by the word and. As in, I know we have to do everything in the backlog. And there's this other thing that came out of the meeting this morning that's really important, right? But on the developer side, on the product management side, we live in an exclusive or world. And fundamental conflict of interest here because the ands really want us to say yes, and the exclusive ors really tell us that the, there's no white space, right? So we also know that the way we get stuff done, the way we finish anything, especially in an agile world, is we actually get a few things done instead of being 45% finished with 90 or 100 things, right? Um, and so if I ask the executive question, which is what's, what's the takeaway for someone who sits in the executive suite? What are we supposed to learn here? The thing we're supposed to learn is that there really are hard trade-offs to make. Nobody believes that. But there are hard trade-offs to make. And we have to make some. We have to decide what's important. And then we have to push back on the magical thinking that says, I know that on, in Friday's staff meeting, we agreed on what was important. But I was on this call with a customer this morning, right? And it's, it's BT, or it's Deutsche Bank. And they said that if we can just add this little security feature in, and how hard could it be, right? We've all been in that discussion. Who's, who's been on the wrong end, right? So somehow we've got to bring ourselves back to the discussion that says magical thinking doesn't work so well in the face of gravity, right? We all good so far? OK. All right, so, so there's one. So, Law number one, ruthless prioritization means if you're not being ruthless about it, you're not getting stuff done and you're not doing your job. OK, easy. Let's keep going. So two, uh, here's our fact, right? And the way I usually describe it is this way, right? Anybody old enough to remember this? Um, if you're building software, if you're building software for the commercial markets, and I'm going to make a distinction in just a minute with professional services, but if you're building software for the markets, for the masses, for the commercial world, all of the profits, all of the money is in the next marginal subscriber, transaction, dating user, um, sign up, right? Whatever it is that you're doing. If you're in the stock, it's a stock trading business, it's the next stock trade. If it's in the um, real estate, uh, um, no, I was telling this about looking at real estate listings, right? It's the next person up. <coughs> Indeed, and, and that's in fact the major point, which is if it's not the same software, then you don't get to end, you're still on one, right? So <laughs> in order to make money in the commercial software world, you have to find end users or end subscribers or end transactions or end copies of exactly the same thing, because that's what it is. Okay, so um, let's do some math, and, and I, I had some folks uh, correct me on this before. I think that's a pile of euros, isn't it? Right. Um, anybody want to tell me what a development team, let's say, of eight people, so a scrum team plus a product manager, you know, developers, some UX folks, what does that cost here? 
A million euros, good. There you go. Winning answer, okay. All right. Wasn't so hard, right? Okay, so roughly speaking, your team of eight costs you a million euros, okay? If you work for a medium to large software company, spending a million euros on development makes a promise to the rest of the organization, right? And it makes a promise for something. What does it promise? Five million, okay, good. We're gonna go a little higher here, but five's a good answer. In fact, here, why don't you pass it back, right? Um, so the point in a commercial software company of spending a million euros on building something is because we're gonna sell a bunch, right? And in fact, if you open up the, the uh, the P&L of any big software company, you find out that most of the money is not spent on development, right? It's spent on marketing and sales and, and mark and support, right? And going to club and real estate and all the pizzas that we had, right? Roughly one sixth of the money ends up being spent on development and the other five sixths is spent on all the other things that we hope bring in money, right? So. If we take that one six and turn it over on its head, the, the important thing here is if you're gonna spend a million euros this year on developing something, you're making a promise now or later in the future to bring about six million euros of revenue in, right? And this is where we're gonna get back to the professional services problem because it's pretty hard to mark up professional services 6X, right? Um, so, so we're gonna get in trouble any minute now. But the thing that's really most important and, and came from the back there is, what do we think our incremental user cost is? If you're in the software business, as opposed to the professional services business, you should be able to add new users or new transactions or new subscribers or new e-faxes or new uh, real estate agents at nearly no marginal cost, right? Because otherwise, you're building it all over again. And that's really important because the thing we're trying to do no surprise, right, is we're not actually trying to minimize the cost of building software, right? We call that, what do we call that? We actually call that in-house IT, right? If you're in-house IT, you're judged on cost, and the goal of the organization is to spend the least possible amount of money, right, and get something done, perhaps, maybe not, right? But if you're in the software business, the goal is actually to make a lot of money. Forgive me, I'm from San Francisco where that's our team sport, right? Um, <laughs> That's where venture capital comes from. That's where all goodness flows from, and it's all about money, right? So uh, back in the, uh, you know, in the commercial software world, we're not trying to minimize costs. We're trying to maximize revenue, which is why, see if anybody recognizes this chart, OK? Anybody know what this chart is? Sorry? It's SaaS pricing. That's right. So here you go. So the answer is every SaaS product in the world uses this price list, right? There's a basic one, whatever you call it, and there's an expanded one, whatever you call it, right? Why does the chart look this way? To make money. To make money, yeah, but you, the, that's why we're here, but be, to make more money, right? There's something special about this. Make you pick the middle one. Make you pick the middle one, right. So the thing that's special about this, first of all, is it makes selling easier because you only talk with folks about three choices, right? And it makes marketing easier because you can explain who it's for on the three choices. And it makes development a lot easier because you don't have to do two to the end sets of permissions as all of your customers walk down and say, I want this one, but not this one, and I want this one, not that, right? If you give them the Chinese menu option of two to the end permissions, you got a lot of developers banging their heads against the wall, right? And the most important part of this chart is this row right here, which is, this is the magic product management problem of what's the thing that's gonna get folks to upgrade from the basic to the advanced, right? If you're in the freemium market, what's the stuff that's not in the basic free product that's gonna cause two or five or eight or 1% of your users to pay us money, right? If you've got the, the home version and the office version, what's the thing? Because if you choose wrong here, right? That's right. Um, Probably nobody here is old enough to remember what the very last punch card in the deck said. Anybody know? Anybody know what the last punch card in the punch card deck read? Okay, I didn't think so. It read end of job, okay? Which was useful in the old days. But in the new days, the answer is if you pick wrong, end of job, okay? Close the doors, go work somewhere else, right? Really important. 
And so we want to set up a, a very simple set of things so it's easy to build, it's easy to sell, it's easy to market, so that we can sell a lot of it to a lot of people, right? Um, why do we want to do this? We want to do this for this reason, right? This is the product management problem. And the product management problem is we built something beautiful. <laughs> and the silence was deafening, right? Um, actually, th this isn't true. OK. Anybody tell me? There's one thing worse. There's something worse than building a product that nobody buys. That's it. That's exactly right. So, so the only thing worse, the only thing worse is building a product that you thought had a mass market and having only one customer buy it. Because now you've got five years worth of support and obligations and angry phone calls, and you didn't make much money, right? So I would much rather have canceled this at the beginning than canceled it at the end, right? Really important. Which takes us, I think, uh, head and shoulders uh, right into the professional services question. Because a lot of the folks that I've worked with here in Dublin and around the world have built up professional services organizations which is great. Somebody tell me how professional services works. What's the economic model? Sorry? Billable hours. That's right. The unit of work is billable hours. And more is better. And you mark them up 40%. And with overhead, you get to keep about 20%, right? And if you can keep your folks busy, you make money, right? By the way, there's almost no startup costs for professional services, because usually you're the first one. and so. Uh, and what's the, what's the thing we measure in professional services? What's the critical number? Yeah, there's another one. Utilization. utilization. There we go. I think one for each of you on this one, right? So <laughs> utilization is the number one thing everybody worries, worries about in professional services because if you're keeping your folks busy, you're making money. If you're not, you're not. And how do you grow professional services? More bodies, More bodies right? because um, there's lots of unemployed high-end developers who are great here, right? Um, let's talk for a minute, though, about um, software as a business, software, commercial software as a business. Different model. What's the unit of growth? Units. Units, subscribers, sales, transactions, right? But you've got to spend a bunch of money to get there, right? Because in general, you can't take money for it until it works, and you price it for value, not for markup. Right? And if you expect to sell hundreds or thousands of copies, you price it so that you make money when you get to hundreds or thousands of copies, not on the first one. Right? You don't get to mark up 40% just because it took you the million euros to build it. Nobody's going to pay you 1.4 million euros for the very first copy. Right? So you've got to invest. Uh, but if you get it right, there's, there's a big slope here. Right? And so here's, here's the challenge, which is I see companies all over the world that are very successful that are 80 or 85 or 90 percent professional services. And I see companies all over the world that are successful that are 80 or 85 or 90 percent licensed software revenue or subscription revenue. The middle ground, actually, I think I have a picture of the middle ground. Here we go. So, anybody know? Right? <laughs> so, it turns out you can be one, you can be the other, right? It's okay to be a duck and it's okay to be a horse, but being half professional services and half product revenue. It's, right? it's just an opportunity for the executive team to rip itself apart. Right? Why? Because the professional services team makes money when it's busy. right? And so their goal in life is to find more and more projects to bill your customers for. Right? And they make money, and the customers pay the money. But that's not why the customers signed up. Right? If you're trying to be in the software business, you want to have as few professional services, at least for the core product, is possible because you want to sell a lot of it, right? So this is the choose your animal, right? Um, very painful. OK, so <laughs> um, be one, be the other, but, but go back. So here's our second law, which is it's the law of build once, sell many. Again, completely obvious. Until that sales meeting has just let out and your sales VP comes in and says, I know this is what we sell, but there's this other thing, by the way, it can't be that different. It's probably only 10 lines of code, right? So, so this is one where the executive's job, where the executive team's job, is to keep ourselves focused on the segments that we're building for, not the individual deals, because the individual deals are, we're being recorded here, OK. The individual deals are like crack cocaine, OK? <laughs> one or two, you know, 
you think you're not in the habit. But um, once you start bringing those specials in and once you start doing the one-offs and, right, you're down the road. Okay, so law one, law two here, we, right? Ruthless prioritization or you get nothing done. Uh, build one, sell many, or you make no money. Our third one here is that software bits are not the product. Why are software bits not the product? Anybody? Sorry? Customization, yeah, that's the wrong answer, but keep going. Okay, so um, <laughs> here's my point. Um, we're gonna stay? Stay. Okay, good. So software is important. Software is part of what we do, but it ain't the whole product, right? If you don't understand who it's for, if you haven't solved a real problem, uh, Des Trainer and all the intercon folks tell us all the time about jobs to be done, right? If you don't know who it's for and what job it's going to solve, then it's just a heaping, steaming, pile of bits, right? right? Nobody cares. If you don't know, if it doesn't have a working solution, maybe it needs docs, maybe it needs third parties, maybe it needs integration, maybe it needs training, whatever it needs. Uh, generally, the software by itself doesn't do much until you get folks using it for the right problem, right? If you can't position it, describe it, tell a story about who should love it, and nobody's going to buy it, nobody's going to love it, and there's no money coming in, right? So when we talk to our engineering teams, of course, we love them. And I think Niall made the point, by the way, um, I don't know if you know this, but all developers are smarter than all product managers. Okay? <laughs> and there's proof. What's the proof? Just ask them, OK? <laughs> right? So <laughs> we need to motivate them. We need to help them along. We need to love what they do. But what they do is not the whole product. And, and if you ask an engineer, the engineer will tell you that the code is the product. And we know we're, we're in deep water when that happens. So I pulled a bunch of very scientific data. Come on, scientific data, right? Which, in my personal experience, means I won't show you the numbers and they may not be real. Um, but if I take apart a whole ton of products that have failed in the market, here's what I see. I see a huge slice of those products that didn't really solve a problem or didn't really solve a problem that needed solving. I see a huge slice where nobody thought about why it was better or different, right? And I see a huge slice of folks who forgot how to get it to market, or they forgot to tell sales why it was important, or they're selling it direct and it should go through the channel, or the other way around, right? So all of those things, by the way, the things not in gray, are things that engineers and developers can't fix, okay? Certainly we got products that we lose because there's bad quality. And certainly we have products that we lose because they're late. But my observation is most of this is self-inflicted and most of it doesn't fall on engineering, right? And so you can't have engineering try to dig yourself out because they're the wrong people, right? So that part of the slice is the thing that we should be worrying about most as executives or as product managers, which is who the F is it for? What story are we going to tell them about why they need it? How should we know they love it, right? Why does it make them heroes, right? This is the stuff that happens early on to get it right, okay? In fact, here, here's our little takeaway, which is I would claim that almost all the success of a product happens before you assign the development team, right? Before you get into JIRA and start writing stories, before you wireframe it. If you're fixing the wrong problem, if there's nobody to buy it, if nobody cares, if there's a thousand competitors and they're all solving the problem, then you're in the wrong place, right? And again, engineering can't get us out of that if engineering didn't get us into it, right? Really, really important because in the executive team, generally what we do is we whip the development team harder until we make revenue, right? Good for morale. Okay, so that takes us to law number three, um, which is I'm going to call it targeted whole product. We have to know who it's for. We have to know why they're going to love it. And it has to have all the piece parts which may or may not be software, right? Because customers buy solutions, right? They may or may not need our software. And honestly, they don't care about our software, right? And, and something I've been talking about, which is mean time to joy. So this is the duration between when the person at the customer side makes a payment or signs a purchase order and when anybody on the customer side gets something that makes them happy, right? And if anybody's lived through uh, 
a three and a half year SAP implementation, right? <laughs> Anybody from SAP here, I apologize in advance, right? But, but the classic enterprise model has been pay us a lot of money, do lots of integrations, ask for requirements, right? Armies of people from Deloitte or whatever it is, right? And the mean time to joy is way long. And folks in the software business should be trying to straighten that down and reduce that down so we can get something, any portion of this really useful in a day, right? In the early days of Salesforce, the way Salesforce made a huge impact and made billions of dollars was that any sales rep or any sales manager with a credit card could sign up his or her team and get going on it in about how long? An hour, right? Less if they actually knew the answers, but call it an hour, right? Um, and salespeople all over the world put money in the till because they could be productive in an hour and find some joy and close some more deals where the on-premise CRM vendors were telling them that the implementation was going to be two years, right? And was, was Salesforce perfect in those days or even now? No, but right, get there, right? So executive job, right? Focus on the problems worth solving, not the other problems. Make sure that we've actually solved them for the people and we know who they are, right? And have a story to tell. Generally, we don't look to our engineers to tell good stories, at least about our product, right? Somebody better be a good storyteller, and if you're in product management, it's you. Okay, so there's three. Anybody know how many are left? Okay, good. All right, so the fourth one, I'm going to claim you can't outsource your strategy, all right? And what I mean here is um, three, four, five times a week, I get an email from someone who's, who wants the strategy template. Okay? And, and the challenge with the strategy template is if everybody had the same strategy template, everybody would have the same strategy, right? Not an ideal thing. And, you know, the, the endless request for what is the magic formula for prioritizing my backlog, right? And anybody know what the answer is? It depends, right? <laughs> it sure helps to know what problem you're solving, whether you're trying to reduce the performance hits on your website or you're trying to add new feature. There's not a generic answer here. So let's uh, take this apart a little bit, right? And, and here's what I'd first say. Here's our fact. You're going to get a lot of input from a lot of places. None of those are decisions, okay? They're advice, they're help, they're bits, they're suggestions from other folks. Anybody have a voice of the customer program? Okay. What kind of people go to that event? Uh, we go to them. Okay, you go to them. And what kind of people do you go out to them for? Well, normally it's, it's uh, clients, CEOs. Right. People that are out to the, <laughs> the business Right. Uh, on average, when we actually ask the hard question of who your voice of the customer is, it turns out to be your largest customers and the most senior people at your largest customers, and the ones who come to the big events that you throw every year for the senior people at your largest customers. Um, you know what happens when you only listen to your largest customers and their big employees? You end up in the professional services business, okay? Can't recommend it. All right, surveys, we all do surveys, right? It's really handy to know who's answering them and whether you care. Uh, anybody do crowdsourced feature ranking? Okay, I think this is really cool. By the way, I would never let my customers give me an absolute answer and, and do the things that they asked me to do based on the ranking. Why? Horse. Sorry? It's the faster horse rate. In general, the people who are answering the surveys are the ones who either have an issue right now or really love your product and are more technical than average, right? Um, anybody do showcases at the end of your sprints? Okay. Um, who? Who are the people who come to your showcase at the end of the sprint? Your advocates, right. If they're internal, they're advocates. If, if you're in the commercial software business, they're a special kind of customer. What customer are they? Sorry? Stakeholders. Stakeholders. Yeah, that's a, that's a mealy-mouthed, um, I don't know what that means, right? But um, <laughs> early adopters, right. The, the two customers who come to your, your um, showcase every two weeks are the two customers who love you the most are the most technical and are desperate for the feature that you're using and they want to review. And they represent not at all the folks who you want to sell to next who've never heard of you and don't know how to use your product, right? So it's great that you've heard from them, but we better not just do what our two most technical customers want us to do 
or we're right back down the road to professional services, right? Competitors, day sheets, I have some more here. Um, anybody, tell, anybody know who your smartest customers are? The loudest, they may be, may be the loudest, but sometimes you know who your smartest customers are. And if you get really good input from them, what's the next thing that happens? The next thing that happens is you're starting to build a product that's well designed for smart customers. And I gotta tell you, the segmentation that says I only sell to smart people, not a winning strategy. Okay, um, anybody know about the executive survey of one? Right, and it is? It's what the CEO says, it says, well, I'm the CEO, right? And there's actually a better one, which is the CEO's mother-in-law survey, right? So, you know, she's not a user. She doesn't actually understand our industry, right? Um, uh, In-flight magazine, do we know about this, right? Uh, AMS, the airline magazine syndrome. So last week, your CEO was on a plane, and they had a, a thing about lean discovery, and he got off the plane, and we're going to do lean discovery, right? This week, he's on a different airline, and they have a piece about Six Sigma, right? Anybody know what he said? He said, the competition's doing Six Sigma, we better do eight, right, okay? <laughs> but luckily, next week he's on a different plane, okay? <laughs> so the point here is we're gonna get a lot of input and none of these represent the market as a whole. We as product people are responsible for making judgment calls about what's important. And there's not gonna be a magic spreadsheet in the back that's always gonna give you the answer. You're gonna have to stand up, right? Um, the other part of this, we, we talked about intercon and in, in, um, instrumenting your applications, which everybody should do, but you've got to know that the analytics that come out of your application are not a strategy. They tell you what's happening, but not why, right? A uh, classic example here is if you're building online dating applications, right, and a bunch of folks are dropping out of the subscription after three months, right, there's generally a couple of reasons, right? One of the reasons is, sorry? They're dead, okay. <laughs> Come, come see me afterwards for a book, better answer, okay, right? Two other reasons, right? One of them is they've gotten dates and they've fallen in love and they don't need you anymore, right? And the other one is they haven't gotten any dates and they haven't fallen in love and you didn't do the job for them, right? So we're not sure on the basis of people canceling out of our, our, um, our system whether we should be happy or not. We, we gotta look underneath. And the next thing is if you just do bottom-up prioritization we score all of our features separately and every feature gets scored and we do ROI and whatever and we'll take whichever ones look the best. This is the product that you get, right? Um, anybody use Microsoft Office? Okay. <laughs> Microsoft Office is the result of 30 years of bottom-up prioritization of features that nobody can find anymore, right? There's ribbons and there's menus and there's settings and there's options and there's almost no one on the planet who can find their way through most of what Microsoft Office gives you because they've kind of forgotten who it's for, right? Um, so we are going to have to make trade-offs. We're going to have to make hard choices. Um, we're going to have to know how all these groups are biased and listen to them more carefully, right? Yes, obvious? Okay, so here's a tool because so far I've just been giving you bad news, right? Here's a tool. This is called prioritization within buckets. Anybody who's read my stuff knows that I'm a fanatic for this. Okay, and they're different colors. That must make them better. Okay, so here's the, here's the theory which says when we open up your backlog or we open up your development um, investment, we're going to see a pie chart that looks something like this. And it's not exactly like, well, maybe it's exactly like this. Okay, you're gonna spend about half of your valuable story points on features. Not all of them, I hope, right? Because you're gonna spend some of your valuable story points on things like refactoring and quality and test automation. And you're gonna spend some of it on, I call them sales one-offs. This is what happens when your VP of sales comes out of that meeting and you don't win the argument, right? These are all the things that you built that weren't in your plan this quarter, right? And you'd like it to be 15%, but maybe in your company it's 20. If we opened up your last quarter backlog and we added it all up, we're gonna see something like this, right? Why is this important? This is important because back to our sales and marketing executives, they don't actually believe this, okay? This is a fact that is not in evidence. And when you ask the folks on the sales side, they're going to say, oh no, we couldn't have spent 20%, and by the way, everything we spent it on brought in revenue. Right? Anybody had this conversation? So we drag up last, last quarter and we say, let's actually go down the list of all the things we built that you demanded that we did 
that made no sense, that didn't deliver revenue, that couldn't work, right? And let's ask the general question. This is, um, you know, th this is a little bit like the, the news. You may not know this. Uh, it's true in San Francisco. But um, joining a gym, joining a health club, has no health benefits. Do you guys know this? Because? You gotta go, right? So uh, most of the people who join gyms and health clubs never show up. And the reason that, that uh, gyms are in business is because 90, 95% of the folks pay their monthly subscription There's n and never show up. There's not enough room in any gym in the world for all the people who are paying the money, right? And, and, and this is all about behavior modification, which is to say, each time the sales team comes to you and says, I need a little extra discount beyond the discount permissions, and you know, we need to build this one thing, right? You're in this one little slice, and it's, it's the verbal equivalent of, I'll start going to the gym next week, right? <laughs> I, I know that this is a one-off, but it's just this week, right? And next week, I'll start going to the gym, right? We all know how this starts. And so being able to put a pin in this and say, let's talk about facts, let's talk about the law of gravity, we could have 15% more features if we could just skim this down from 20 to 10, right? So laws of gravity are important here. OK, let's keep going. Um, and the, again, the reason to do that is because we're going to need a strategy for why these things don't really match that, right? Because we know what it's for. So here's our, I'm sorry, I'm from Silicon Valley. This is our required Steve Jobs quote, right? Um, he didn't say this, but he stood in front of the screen, right? Um, and, and again, hockey's not the, the big sport here, but the, the idea that um, Wayne Gretzky said that he skates to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been, is a strategy point of view. Anybody, and a book to anybody who can tell me who was the person who famously said this before Wayne Gretzky? His father. His father, that's right. So come find me later. So Walter Gretzky, who you've never heard of, is the famous person who said, Wayne, you have to skate to where the puck is going to be, right? This is the strategy statement. If we simply open up the, um, the market research that says everyone is going to mobile devices, did you guys know this? Okay. And that smartphones are going to win, well, all of your competitors are reading that same thing. And you have to decide if maybe there's a laggard market of folks who, who put laptops on their wrists and walk around with laptops and maybe we can sell to them or maybe there's some other strategy because simply having the data is not enough. We have to anticipate where the market's going. We have to have a strategy. We have to make a hard choice, which takes us to, I think, okay, so here's, here's our four laws, right? One, you're never going to have enough resources. So buckle down and make some hard choices because otherwise they're going to make themselves, right? Two, You've got to resist the urge to do one-offs for customers, especially the big ones, if you want to be in the software business, not in the professional services business. Again, I love the professional services business as long as I know I'm in it, but I don't want to be halfway, right? Third, you better know who your customers are and what it takes to deliver a solution, because the bits ain't enough. And no matter how hard we push the engineers, the bits are still not enough. And the last is, you need to take a position. You need to have a strategy. You need to have a sense of where the market is going. Because the 4,000 startups in the San Francisco area, actually, we don't know how many of you are, but we think there's about 4,000 startups, have targeted every market niche in the world. And most of them will fail, right? But it's not enough just to say there's a need here. You've got to have a strategy for why you're going to bring something special, right? Obvious? OK. Back to just the, the summary point, I think, is that when we have conversations with folks from the sales and marketing side of the house, we have to assume that they don't necessarily agree that these are true. And, and from the engineering side, these are completely obvious. But they're not obvious to everybody. And over and over again in the executive suite, what I see is arguments between folks who just know that there's some white space in the in the development calendar, right? Come on, guys, how hard could it be? And the folks who say, well, what are we going to throw out of the boat? And as long as you're able to translate both sides of this and understand the law of gravity, then you're ready to move up to the executive suite where we've got people who fundamentally don't agree with each other rather than just arguing the facts. Good. OK, so that's me. Um, 
that's the book I was given away. That's how to find me. Anybody who didn't get a book, come find me afterwards. I might have something secret for you. And um, thanks for letting me uh, be part of uh, Product Tank Dublin.